to learn, to share. Triage 
It's like herding cats, and I love what you mentioned this morning. It really is, because you have one concept, and then you go into the field, and there you find something else. So you have to use your skills, applying what you learn and what you do, and you use your intuition, which I really appreciate what was said this morning. Wasn't that a great idea? Sure. Yeah. Um, a disaster. We mentioned it earlier. The definition for the World Health Organization is that it is sudden, and that's a key word. It's catastrophic. It's an environmental <coughs> loss. There's always going to be a loss. Human loss, environmental loss, personal property. And it could be caused by many different many different sources, but it is sudden, and people are not expecting it most of the time. And I'm going to move on this area because they were mentioned before, so I'm just trying to summarize, but the PowerPoint will be available for all the students, for everybody that wants it, actually for most of the people who said before. Um, we have human caused disasters, the industrial accidents, shootings, more recently, unfortunately, um, acts of terrorism, uh, they are also like natural disasters, uh, very traumatic, and they may prompt evacuations, displacement of people. But the displacement of people that we're seeing in these days and times are not necessary from one particular community. We have displacement of people from one part of the world to another part of the world, where things are different, are unique for them. And needless to mention, all of the receiving countries of people that have been displaced from other war zones and Turkey being one of the most amazing countries receiving so many of the refugees. It is remarkable and what you are doing must be commended. Um, um, there are also many other mass incidents that can cause trauma and trauma is something that we all endure. We all experience it. What happens is that we, not all of us, experience it in a different way or at a different, on the same level. But it is a human emotion. It is something that we do have. And it is something that, because we have it, because our ancestors also had it, is because we survive. And I think the whole concept of this conference is resilience. Is what makes us long-term survivors? Because we are. Look at us. The planet not only is survived thousands and thousands of years, many catastrophic displacements that we cannot even record because we didn't have social media 500 million years ago or a million years ago. We have it today, so we know more. But it doesn't mean that we did not suffer as a species from day one. And how did we survive? Now we talk about bioethics. Very briefly, because I'm in front of the experts. I just, because we are going to do an exercise, I'm just bringing it back up. So we can focus on what we're going to be doing, hopefully shortly. It has a role when we talk about how do we respond and prepare for natural disasters, or for any type of disasters. And in most institutions, there are protocols. When A happens, you do B. If B happens, you don't do A, B, or C. And the responders have been involved in developing ethical frameworks, decision-making, policy-making, and operations during emergency planning. Um, in, there are several aspects of bioethics principles that need to be, you know, we have to keep in mind. One of them is transparency, and regardless of what approach you take to the concept of bioethics, transparency of the principles of an institution or any type of um, group of people developing the policy is transparency. It should be clear to everyone what it is the protocol for that particular situation. It also involves government officials, it involves community members, but it should be clear to every person in that community. Uh, the next pillar of bioethics principles, regardless of your approach or your belief system, is people should be treated without any kind of reference to socioeconomic status, ethnic background, language background, and that comes 
pulled away from what makes sense. It just is such a simple concept. It makes sense. But then we have laws that have built around it, and human rights have been moving them. So key words today 
uh, ethical disaster resilience global community. In, in psychology, the uh, American Psychological Association describes resilience as adapting well and adversity occurs and how well we adapt to what happens afterwards, meaning the focus is not in the moment but in the long term. How well we do afterwards, if we measure your emotional ranges or your indexes in three months, in six months, in a year, where are you? How, how, what is your resilience? So you have the capacity to bounce back. It's like in football, which is my number one sport, by the way, and I even put it in my profile. I love football. Is how quickly you bounce back. So if you throw something out, if you throw a ball and it comes back, if it is nicely inflated, it will bounce back very quickly. But if it's, there's less air, and less ability and energy inside, it will take a longer time or it may not even bounce back. Same thing with the human emotions and the human uh, resilience. Adversity and stress uh, come in different shapes. It could be not just because of a disaster, but it could, it, it could <coughs> come other, from other sources as well. So a lot of the people that we have interviewed after a disaster, or we have a, a surge personally during crisis interventions, um, one of the factors that explains how well they're going to do is their previous experience in how they dealt with a previous traumatic experience. And it could have been a smaller scale experience. It could have been uh, uh, not a smaller, but smaller if we put it in the scope of things. Uh, losing members of your family, uh, displacement, uh, terrorist attacks. Those are the big in the scope of devastation. Having a separation of your family members or, or your pet perhaps dying. I mean, that's a small scope. But how the individual responded and resonated, the level of, res of resilience that it was experience in those moments may explain how well they're going to have their resilience in a larger scale. So it's always good to monitor how do we do on a day to day if we lose something, if we have something that is not working well, if, if we are frustrated or wanna do we uh, get inwards, do we get angry, do we get upset, or do we just bounce back? And chances are if we do good bouncing in a small scale, we're gonna do a much better bouncing when it comes um, and then culture. We talked so much about that this morning. Because culture is something that defines each one of us. And everyone here has a story or some explanation about his or her own culture. Where we come from, what language we speak, what do we identify with, what's our ancestry. Where do we come from? Do we still want to embrace that or we don't want to associate with that anymore? It's a fascinating variable. But once that when it comes to resilience and disasters and intervention, culture is a very significant variable. And because this is not a research presentation, but I do have lots of resources that I can share with you post the workshop, uh, a recent collection of information on um, several methods and several approaches to look at resilience found that it's, it's, there's a global and a culturally specific aspects and, and they looked at young people. This is a group that looked at 1500 youths and they interviewed them and they, they realized that some of those um, variables were persistent across cultures of what makes someone resilient to a significant or devastating event. They're context specific, meaning what happened? Where were you when this happened? How is the culture of your community or neighborhood or village or government responding to that type is to that type of disaster? Is how you're going to respond to it? Because there is a there is a connection between you and the community that you live and experience. So if I experience trauma, something that is extremely traumatic for me may not be for someone across the world or in a different context. But we all resonate in a different way, in, in, a, in the same way, depending on how much strength that inner 
free experience we have had. Um, the life of a child, and that's why I have worked with children most of my life. It is, it is later in my colleagues in psychology that I'm working with adults, and it is adults with trauma. And the reason, one of the personal reasons is because there were probably children that did not get enough support or enough help that now became adults, and the trauma was carried up in their adult life. So to me, when I'm working with adults, I see the child that didn't have the healing that was necessary at one point in their lives. So the, the collection of studies talks about the aspects of childhood that were rescued and they were very strong, either by the voice of someone. And I'm listening to people talking, oh, my grandmother told me this. Oh, my grandfather said that. Oh, my great-grandfather, I remember him saying that to us. Or whoever is a very important power in the person in your life as a child, tells you something about survival, tells you this is how we did it, and they put power, and then you listen to their wisdom, and again, it resonates with the child. And that explains how resilient that individual will become in the future when he or she becomes an adult. Listening to the voices of our ancestors is a good thing. I'm going to move quickly now because I promised that I was going to talk about the domains and indicators and there are several frameworks that you can look for, several indexes that you can look at. And I'm not going to expand a lot today because we're going to get some hands on, but basically there are several layers and several contexts where resilience and how you measure resilience and the index of resilience and survival is it's a social infrastructure, there are several levels. It's social. Yeah. Is there educational equity? Is there, what's the age? Is transportation accessible? So what do you have in the community when you're going to be doing some type of rescue or support? It's also an economic layer to it. Because you have to see what you have in the area or in the country or the community that you might be working with. And then there's an institutional layer to it which is, uh, what's the mediation plan? Is there a mediation plan? There are so many communities in the world that don't have one. They just live in a day by day, and they don't know. X, Y, and Z will provide if something happens to us. Uh, there is social. Are they, uh, so the, the community, the community disaster index uh, predictions are talking about the uh, non-profit organizations available, you know, the Red Cross the Red Cross of America, the Red Cross of Turkey, Red Cross. Any country, do they have one organization that resonates and supports them? Um, the economic layer, it also talks about, well, look at the economic um, breakdown of numbers in that community and see how much is allowed per capita for rescuing and support and to new disasters. And then there's a the human aspect of it. I'm going to quickly move into this because that involves almost everyone. Uh, the population, the level of education, how many bodies you have available, how many firefighters, how many people you have available in your The key thing I want to move to uh, community preparedness, I think, is one of the highest, it's one of the most significant variables that we need to address when we think about what to do when. And earlier we were talking about how do we do it? How do we maximize resilience? And part of it is preparedness. And uh, one of the models that we have, um, I was earlier talking in the, uh, in the morning with one of the physicians in the group. Um, the United States is not an exception and not have been prepared already. About 30 years ago, there was a devastating earthquake in the state of California, and people were not ready to assume the responsibility of how many people were needed for that particular uh, uh, framework to, to rescue people. In the effort, a lot of the first responders lost their lives. As a result of, of that, <clears throat> There was a coordinating effort from the firefighters, see? So you never know who is going to come up with a brilliant idea that then takes off. This was the firefighters. They decided to get 
to train people in the communities, in the neighborhood communities, anybody with a basic training. So when there is a disaster, the people in the neighborhood or the communities or the villages can take care of themselves. They don't have to wait for someone to come and rescue. And that evolved in the last 30 years. And I was one of those that now became a neighborhood volunteer coordinator. We take care of each other. We don't wait for the governments. We don't wait for the firefighters to take care of us. If there is an emergency in our community, we take care of us. And that is called the Community Emergency Response Team. And I didn't put it in here because I didn't think it was necessary, but if you want information, I can certainly share some with you. It takes three weekends to train a community in first aid, basic rescue techniques, and mental health support. The component also includes mental health support. So why is it important? Disasters, bioethics, resiliency, and culture. It's all connected. Why? Disasters are on the increase. We cannot turn the other way. Do we know more? Because we have social media, because we have access to things that we didn't. And we thought that about 10 years ago. Oh, we know more now. News come faster. But when you look at the statistics, it's because they're happening more. And we have experts that are already talking about global warming and other things are real for the experts to discuss that. It is global. And what we, what I, the framework that I suggest is that we take a perspective for disasters that bioethics, culture, and resilience are incorporated all together. Because look at us right now. We are here, we came from every part that you can think of because we have ideas, because we think that we no longer are a small community, we are a global community. So, one of the things that I need briefly to mention, just because of how I started this, I know that lots of us are going to go back to our hometowns, and we're going to get back into what we do. And many of us, what we do is we, we rescue people. We provide support. We assist for states. We do mental health support after a crisis. One of the things, we cannot take care of others unless, I you finish the sentence, unless we take care of ourselves. So it is very important. If you're going to do one of those rescue herbs out there, do your own index background check once in a while. Check yourself. How am I doing? Did I have any experience? Did I, was, was I recently exposed to something that really made me upset? And I, for once, two weeks ago, I did. It was very personal. It touched home. And I knew that if I had been called to volunteer, I would have said, no, I cannot go. Because I am not doing that okay. So check yourself periodically. Don't think that you can go and save the world. You're going to sound like a cache. You can't. You have to do yourself. Well, after. Check yourself after you intervene and you go. It's very important that you check yourself or your partners, because hopefully you're working with someone else when you rescue. Are there any signs of irritability, anger, self-blame? I couldn't save so-and-so. It's my fault. I didn't get there enough. And, and I experienced those. I have. I have had. If I had done this, if I had gone to the next one, if I had had that training, I would have saved his life. And you do that with someone else. So you do what... Um, it is called, uh, and then of course the physical symptoms, you do have this, lots of other things, headaches, chest pain, increase of alcohol and drug consumption. So lots of volunteers do fall into that category. They want to make the pain go away. And they have nothing else to do, or nothing else to access. So their lives from being a good Samaritan or someone that wanted to help someone became a self-destructive pattern because they were trying to help everyone. Nightmares, as an another one of people that have been themselves exposed to traumatic experiences, but they have themselves helped out. And a, a, a brief story about my experience here in Istanbul. I took a tour two, three days, two days ago, and uh, the tour guide, a very young man, uh, 
he was, because of his, uh, he is a Francophone, Anglophone, and um, German. He speaks German, English, and French, in addition to Turkish. He was asked to go as a volunteer after the earthquake. No training. All he was asked to do is just translate what the doctors need to say to the patient. So he walked along with them, he walked along with the dogs, he walked along, and at one point, all he had to do was translate. Well, we started talking after the tour, and he said to me, Raquel, I, I still have flashlights, I still have nightmares that there was one particular individual that I had to walk away because the physician told me we have to move to the next person, and I wanted to stay there. And it was very traumatic for him. So be mindful of those individuals that you utilize in situations of crisis. They also need help. They need to be supported after a crisis. Even your interpreters, which sometimes you don't even think that they're doing the job for us. They're doing exactly what we tell them to do, not what they would like to do themselves. He says, I wish I could have stayed and saved that man's life. But we had to move to the next one. Um, of course, basic things to really stress are exercising, sleeping, balancing your work, going to your spiritual practices, whatever it is that you do. If it, even if it is just not doing anything more than just spending time with yourself, this is, is very helpful. And then what we were talking earlier, encouraging the rescuers to rest and to regroup whenever you have a chance. Again, we talked earlier, these are ideal situations. When you are in the real thing, in the real world, you may not have an opportunity to do that. But eventually, as soon as you can, and you are rotated from your teams, and you're moved to take care of yourself. If you think that this is important, then you will, you will find the time to do um, now, we're going to get into the activity portion of it. By the way, any comments at this point? Any, any reactions? Any comments? Any comments at this point? Can you hear me now? Yes. So we're going to move to the interactive part. But before we do that, I want to hear any questions or thoughts in your mind or comments or anything that went through your mind when we were just sharing this information with you. Anything at all? Are we thinking too much or we're not? Yes. I had uh, two or three or three, but last two uh, was uh, very, very important. The one per day, 2011 mm -hmm. and 2012. Uh, 7.3 magnitude it was. I know that uh, every person on your own. It is the important point you uh, explain that. Therefore, each person should learn what, uh, what she or uh, he to do uh, to cover the problems. It is very important uh, to be calm down and uh, I remember that my uh, apartment, I was fourth floor, um, almost my uh, walls uh, destroyed all of them. <laughs> I was uh, surprised and I shocked. Uh, everybody in the street <laughs> I see and <laughs> look at me. It was really difficult, but the countdown is the first thing. Therefore, uh, it is our problem. We are Mediterranean people. We are uh, angry easily. We are excited every time. <laughs> and uh, we uh, tend to exaggerate uh, something. That is the big problem. And uh, that is the first thing. And after, we can uh, produce uh, some solution because uh, the we you, uh, you explain that uh, for example firefighter or uh, the policeman or security or any other mm -hmm. it it takes time thank you 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 thank you
and therefore we found uh, the, a field and uh, everybody uh, dri dri drive the uh, car mm -hmm. and we slept at the car, in the car. It was an insecure place. And secure than uh, houses. So you were sequential. Yeah. Okay. Therefore, that time um, we have a motto. Uh, first of all, you have to have a car, and after you can <laughs> buy a house. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? Yeah, it's a time to reflect, and I think that now we're going to get uh, this. We're going to get busy. So what we're going to do with um, the facilitators or the people that are in this wonderful, lovely house that's accommodating us today, mm -hmm. we're going to break into groups, into four groups. Uh, and again, this is a volunteer participation. If you feel that you don't want to do it, it's okay. I will, uh, so we're going to find a place, so how many people do we have right now present that would like to participate? This is an exercise on basically um, what we are here to do this week. We are here to think and to work on an action plan, meaning what, what do we do when and what is the target for the area that we are interested in resolving the problem. So it's a time to reflect. And for those of us that tomorrow are going to be working on your action plan, some of you today, it'll give you a chance to think a little further. Perhaps it is your plan, the one that you want to think about. Uh, so we're going to break into four groups, and what I will uh, ask is volunteer professors. I would like to have one instructor, and this is an idea that another professor gave me, I give the credit to uh, Professor Damon. We are going to have one instructor in each group that is going to help students or the yeah, members of that group as a facilitator. So, are we ready to do this? Yes, yes? okay. So, uh, do you need the mic to, uh, to record? Yes. Oh, you do, okay. So, what we're going to do is we're going to break into four groups. You just get a group of, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so. Four groups of four groups. Okay, then let's let's just get four groups together. Some people can stay here and work. Some other groups can go upstairs. Another group can go out, and we are only going to work for 15 minutes. And um, so we have to get off our chairs and get going if you want to participate in this. Your assignments are in this little in this little package. Basically, we are going to be doing. Um, we're going to be talking about any kind of, any kind of experience that you may have had in the past. And then briefly talk, uh, briefly, again, we want to do this maximizing our time. Pretend that you're out there in the field and you have a situation. You're not going to use a half an hour per person to talk about what's going on. If you need that, we, we have to do it in another, in another time. Tomorrow we'll put another workshop together. So today we're just going to allow one volunteer in the group that wants to talk about that. Okay? And how were you impacted? And you can share that with the group. Then I want you to think about how do you, how do you, what are your working solutions? What, what materials do you need? Let's say your plan is to expand capacity of resilience in your neighborhood. I mean, so it pretty much follows the line that um, uh, we have been following in LBD for action plans, what materials, what solutions, what are the resources that you need. And you're going to choose the best, the best workable solution for your problem. And then after 50 minutes, we're going to come back to the room and each one is going to report in just a few minutes what was your plan, what were your resources and what did you learn from each other or got from each other during that experience? Okay? Yes? Yes. Anyone excited or not really? I'm asking you to work after lunch. How are you doing this? That's good. <laughs> Most of you thought that the 
the university that you're actually working here. Okay, so um, you decide who wants to be the group. We need one instructor per group. And I'll see you in 15 minutes. Uh, we were four people who were actively in the disaster. I had my experience, and I told this, I think we were in that session, I told about the 1999 earthquake when I was in the last year of my medical faculty. We went there with my classmates, and with also some medical students, and it was really traumatic. For afterwards, for six, seven years, basically until I had my kids, um, I had some nightmares, etc., but also I couldn't sleep without the whistle on my bedside table, water, or, you know, I had always things at my bedside table as if, uh, if necessary, they can run out. And then, I know it's very exciting to talk, I know that, so it's, and then the second, the second part also, Shukran said that he, she's always looking at the door whenever she goes new somewhere. The first thing she checks is where can I escape. Uh, and also another Amazon from my group, where is she? Um, so well, she's, uh, she's not here at the yeah. moment, but she said also, uh, after the flood she experienced, she's always looking for a secure place to put uh, her things. So we can say from these observations that everybody who has been in a real disaster is experiencing some psychological and physiological aspects and, and, and symptoms. This is, I think, unavoidable. And then we ask to each other, uh, what can be done? What, did we, what can we suggest for further uh, applications? We all think that, okay, being ready for the disasters, like now what we are doing, talking about it, thinking about it, and making some trans training programs are very important. But the more important thing, I think, to take these kind of practices and thinking uh, processes seriously. Because I remember when I was in the high school, I had the first earthquake education, and our teachers took us out, and they said, okay, now there is an earthquake, how can you go down from the fire stairs and all that? It was so boring and meaningless. Uh, I didn't know that I would have an uh, earthquake experience myself in six years. Uh, I didn't even know I would study medicine. It was on my mind, but you know, these things just come unplanned. And I remember making ghost, making ghost steps and you know, jokes. It didn't mean anything. It was just a waste of time. You know, for two hours we were outside the building just doing some nonsense. So we said to each other in the workshop, uh, these kind of training programs should not only start, uh, there is an idiom in Turkish, I'm sure Turkish people will understand, like, we say, like, just to do it, just to do a training, just to show on paper. We did it. But not really putting your heart in it, not really feeling what it means. So we said, we told maybe making these training programs, even beginning from kindergarten, she said, uh, it's important, so it must be a part of our education. It must be in the curriculum, really. And also, if there's another item in terms of real earthquakes. We see kids, instead of running with their parents, they are trying to collect their bodies. You know, and it's also increasing the life danger. So they need to understand now there is a serious situation. You need to really, you need to really act. And then the other thing, uh, you also uh, pointed out, I saw it in last summer in uh, Seefeld, uh, Austria. Uh, we were there, I was there for a congress, but on the weekend we saw a poster and it was saying that the fire brigade made for kids. Uh, so the fire, firemen were making a day off open door for the kids. Then we went there, we found out that all firemen there were not from outside, they were the villagers. Because they said to us, and it was wonderful for me, for, I taught Turkey, because there are eastern parts of Turkey that nobody really wants to go. They said, these Austrian villagers said, nobody will want to come and live here with us. Uh, it's difficult to reach, so in every house we, found, we chose somebody as a volunteer to take these educations. From, from every house, there is one fire person. It was amazing. 
and it was it always uh, stick on my mind as an example. And the last point we want to emphasize um, in, in in Germany. Uh, and I'm sure in many of European countries, and in Turkey, I don't know the law, I don't have any time to check, but there is a situation called CBE, Continued Medical Education. It's a must that medical doctors should continue to take some courses, some seminars, in order to increase. It can be about your profession, or you can just go to a mindfulness uh, seminar, and you can also show it. Uh, as a, for example, the group I'm working in Germany, it's about, it's called Medicis. We are against taking any gifts from pharmaceutical companies, no free lunch movement, so we have seminars. So now I thought maybe the CME programs in Turkey or all countries would also be, it should include disaster training programs. And it must be even obligatory because there are some obligatory trainings in Turkey, I know, but by law, I don't know how much of this is obligatory, but we can include these kind of programs. So this was our Amazon's Amazon. And I love I can very much. I think we will continue to talk and write and practice this time. To summarize, I can hear you the following. The Amazons thought about importance of re focusing on your own experience, which is something that we talked about. And if you have your own experience, then you have to work on it and be prepared before you go and, and, and help someone. Then the awareness of, we don't seem to be prepared. What are we going to do? Let's start with educating our children. Let's start in kindergarten. Let's expand the model that you have observed in Germany and Austria, which is continuing education for medical doctors to do uh, rescue and, and stay mindful. And yes, mindfulness is a very important part of the training because it focuses on what you're doing in the moment. Thank you. Next group, who's ready? What's the next group that is ready? This group? We're not, we're all here yep. to help and okay. Yes. Who, who's doing it? Okay. Okay. Let's go, please stand together. Uh, as a courtesy to the next presenter because Free it's you. almost four o'clock. Free of you, please. Let's, yes. As a courtesy to the next presenter, let's keep. I know I'm so happy that you're so excited. That means that you're thinking. Let's give it to a very short brief to the important things that your job, your group discussed. Thank you. My team, we call it the BSMD team, composed of Bangladesh. Philippines, Malaysia, and of course, Turkey. And it will be presented uh, both by uh, you, by Malaysia. Yes, please. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, to be frank, uh, we had uh, very little time. With whatever time we had, we just had a brief discussion. And uh, in our group, uh, one thing was that each person went through a different disaster, like from war to flood and uh, house, house burning. So uh, it went, by the time we heard everybody, we, it was very difficult for us to come to a conclusion or consensus. But however, we uh, uh, defined our one problem, that is uh, collection during disaster. So. Uh, we identify there are two levels of corruption. One is the international level of corruption and other one is the domestic level of corruption. So, uh, other corruption we, saw, uh, we identified is, uh, one of our uh, teammates told us, uh, sometimes when there is a disaster in the developing countries, uh, what happens is, some medicines which is not tested in other countries, the, they test it in these countries. So this is one thing which is very dangerous. So some of the solutions we uh, uh, thought of is, one is we need to educate the people about all these things, corruptions and everything. Second thing is there should be a transparency of information. Now in today's world of social media, it's not difficult for us to uh, share the information. Everybody should know what is the funding received and where it is being spent. And third is uh, 
uh, social media has to be used effectively. So we reach the right people, and uh, the sources are distributed evenly among the team. Uh, so the roles and responsibility of international and local consultants have to be defined very well, so that each one knows what is the role and it is not redundant or duplicated. And finally, the politicians have to be a bit away from this whole process, so they just can avoid corruption. And direct access to the beneficiaries is very important. So if there is any financial aid, it's always important that it reaches the beneficiary directly. So these were some of the solutions we thought. So uh, uh, we had uh, limited time. Our professor and mentor will be giving you details about this in a presentation. Uh, combating disaster caused by graft and corruption. Thank you. Uh, the summary for this group is they focus on the government and the institutions. They wanted to access uh, transparency, which is one of the principles that we talked earlier. Access, meaning access from everyone. Distri equal distribution of benefits, and that it goes straight and directly to the beneficiaries, to the people that are really victims. They should go directly. So excellent work. Thank you so much. We are ready for the third group. We need group number three, and we are yeah, three people, I think. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I asked him for uh, an experience. Uh, first question was uh, emergency. Uh, did you have heavy experience emergency or disaster? And uh, I got answered uh, in Thailand. Uh, Thailand people we work on agriculture actually mostly. And uh, when the disaster uh, actually. It might be typhoon or uh, tsunami uh, come flood, 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 and the people lost everything and lost their, uh, their job. And uh, we focus on this. Uh, so our model, model country is Thailand. Uh, they will present their solution, uh, and my solution is. Uh, of course, there's uh, mental aspects of all disasters. Uh, after uh, disaster came, uh, people mentally affect. And what can be done for this? Uh, I suggest that uh, people and young people, especially, uh, can be sent the disaster area and uh, mentally can mentally. Uh, give give their supports uh, as 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 say yeah it's a therapy like a therapy <laughs> but it's uh, mental therapy uh, psychological, psychological yeah psychological support uh, because think about uh, you all around the world uh, people coming to you and say. We are with you. We uh, we believe you, and okay, it can be done. And so that stuff. Uh, for the other solution, I invite my friends. Okay. So uh, to uh, further with the mental aspect, uh, so uh, psychological support, we actually had a we collaborated with uh, the idea already. We want other countries, or we hope that other countries would go uh, for me. It would be the Philippines, where we help the less fortunate with their mental health and um, their psychological well-being, as well as uh, in the in Bangkok, where in flooding is the most common uh, disaster. We propose that we will build a greenery wherein we will have enclosed structures with better machinery and engineering and better water flows and air uh, air systems and as well as sunlight and solar systems where we could help with the uh, growing agriculture and uh, plants. <laughs> Hopefully.
or uh, for these uh, workers who uh, and farmers who lost their farmlands from the flood. And um, another proposal would be having uh, their houses and their uh, infrastructure to have a better foundation, a uh, high-rise infra uh, infrastructure, wherein their foundations would be uh, would have a free space under it, so that when there uh, there is a flood that would be coming. Water would be flowing under the foundation of the house and it would not reach the first level or the second level of the house. So the house would have a free space under it where the water would flow and so it would not affect the house and help them to not be uh, devastated with uh, losing their homes. Then next would be um, having drills in uh, educational systems where these uh, drills would help in educate, educating students and better awareness to uh, in this uh, uh, disaster resiliency. So these drills would help the uh, students. This would uh, teach them how to uh, manage when disaster comes and that it should be implemented well and uh, it would have it should have a strong what is this? Uh, it should have a strict implementation in educational uh, systems. Uh, that <laughs> so to summarize, this group really look into the infrastructure, which is something that we talked about. They look at infrastructure. They also look at model countries. They chose uh, Thailand, correct? Is that the country that you chose? Thailand? Yes. Thailand as a model country. So they're applying what works in one place, let's not reinvent it. If it's working in one place, let's copy that model, let's implement it where we are. And then collaboration. Collaboration between different countries because you have certain resources. And mental health, that's the part that was going to be beautiful. Thank you so much. So we're ready for the last group. Is there another group? Yep. Well, we're done? We're up there. Do we have another group? Yes, we no. do. The shy ones? <laughs> The yeah. shy ones. Okay, so we have the Amazons. They started the whole thing. Strong and powerful. And then we have we, we have one more group, yes? Do you want to briefly summarize it? Yes, I do. Please? Shiloh? <laughs> See, we always have. It's like uh, Professor was saying earlier, herding cats. I'm doing the same thing. I'm, I'm, I'm asking my little kittens, come on down. Come on, come on. Are they cats? Come on, cats. He has to be on the report. <laughs> okay, I don't have the paper, otherwise I can't read it. It's, it's totally voluntary. But it's exactly, it's voluntary. However, if you want a certificate from the conference. That's <laughs> commercial. <laughs> 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 Oh, it's a volunteer. Yes. Okay, you can. <laughs> Go ahead. I volunteer now. He wants to volunteer we now. We call it the pre mac principle. I'm, I'm the if cat now. If, if we call it the psychology of the pre mac principle. <laughs> Eat your spinach and then you can have your ice cream. <laughs> Please go in front. Okay. Hello. Marlon, where are you? <laughs> um, it's a, a group of dominated by Filipinos. And we have one uh, Iran. Iran. From, from Iran. And the common problem that we had is actually flood. So we zeroed in also in flood. But basically, we did not go into the disasters that come after or during the flood. But we actually uh, um, had a common uh, notion about preparedness. Education, since we are all educators, we wanted to do something like prevent the disasters or the loss of lives by, by helping those in the flood lines, the, the river banks, um, to educate them about what are the dangers that might happen to them um, during floods or during or before the rain comes. Um, basically, they they own the land, or maybe they don't own the land, but it's the only piece of land where they can stay. Maybe a, squ a squatter, or, or, or maybe they own it. 
but most of those in the river banks or river banks, they don't own the land, so we cannot take it away from them. But telling them about the disasters and telling them that, that they should prepare for possible things, um, I think uh, it, it boils down to education, no matter how high is their educational achievement, or they may not have stepped in the grade school or even in high school, but if you tell them these are the, the consequences that may happen, and uh, going to the public may be difficult, but then um, our friend from Iran said, if you go to the mosque or in holy places, the, the preacher or the, the imam or the, the Buddhist monk may be the most influential person to tell the other people that this you should follow because this might happen. So side by side with education, our educators um, in, in, in the Philippines, educators or teachers are also one of the influencers in the society. So uh, educators or teachers may be able to influence them also and tell them about what's going to happen. So I think if they know what's going to happen, they may um, prepare and open up and prepare for the possible disasters so we can avoid it. Thank you. I, I can't thank enough for all the amount of talent, thought with such a short amount of time. You're amazing. I am, I am in awe at all of you. Uh, the last group actually work on their own uh, facilities and their own limitations and they have a, a, a very good idea that they thought about which is again, you touch on infrastructure, you touch on preparedness, community preparedness is the greatest variable. You only have 72 hours, 72 hours and you're on your own. In uh, the Federal Emergency Management administration in the United States tells you that there are at least three days before someone can reach you. So you need to be prepared for at least 72 hours. The 72 hours are on your own. Um, the ancestry, again, listening to the voices of the ancestors. Uh, listen to your spiritual community. They, have the, they are the first teachers in many communities, so you access that. That's a, that's a lot of wisdom right there. And educating education, it all comes down to education. Any final comments or thoughts from anyone? Professor Maser, would you like to? Great job. Okay, thank you.